So after a year, we finally have a name for our youth group. We were just the youth group at the way. But now we finally have a name. We are charged up. Woo! <laughs> Acts 1 and 8 says, you shall receive power after Holy Ghost has come upon you. Right? So we are char charged up. What? So for our special emphasis today, we have a very special young lady who's going to come up. She's Brittany McBride. Brittany McBride, she's going to come and do a, a she's going to share some things from her heart. So I want you to welcome her as she comes up. She's wonderful. She got the McBride anointing all over her. Come on. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Brittany McBride, and I'm here to address the purpose of the way youth, youth ministry, um, also known as Charge Up. Um, being a young person in society today, I definitely feel like a youth group is needed, especially with all the temptations and influences. Um, I've had a conversation with some of the youth around me, and I've gotten a frequent response of, I don't like going to church or youth groups because I feel like God is being forced onto me. And, well, that's where Charged Up is different. Charged Up is a place where youth embark on their own personal journey to find God. It's not forced, it's more of group discussions with others your age and a mentor, Miss Tanisha, guiding you through it. Recently, we've been intertwining justice and spirituality. We've been discussing the Jordan Davis case, um, which is a Florida native um, who was at a gas station with a group of his friends blasting loud music in the car. And a white man um, got out of his car and told them to turn their music down. And they said, no, we're not turning our music down. And he pulled out his gun and he shot several times at the car, um, killing one of the passengers in the back seat named Jordan Davis. Um, so we have been discussing that and how one's personal bias can cloud their judgment, as well as how to bring God's message and the help of God for one battling their own personal struggles with bias. Um, so if there are any new youth here today, we will encourage you to come out and try Charged Up every second and fourth Sunday. Um, may we please have the youth stand up and people around you, can you just stretch a hand towards them as we pray? God, we ask you to bring deep conviction of sin, spiritual brokenness, and holy fear of God, and genuine repentance among the youth, Lord. Lord, we pray for deep cleansing, genuine repentance, and spiritual power to engulf our young people. Father, we ask you to bestow spiritual hunger in our young people and draw them to fervent intercession, Lord God. Lord, fill the youth with passion to see their friends saved, Lord. God, please pour out your spirit on us like a mighty flood, Lord God. And we pray for a mighty move of conviction and salvation in our communities and schools. Thank you for everything you've done for us, Lord, and we love you. In your name, amen. 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 Come on, Rick. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God is moving yes. among our youth. The main thing about our youth ministry is that we really want our young people to experience the presence and the power of God. Fun comes and goes, that's cool, that we can have all the fun we want. But unless you know God for yourself, unless you can experience his presence for yourself, nothing else matters. And once you experience his presence, nothing else compares to it. Not drugs, not boyfriends, girlfriends, sex, 
turn up. Nothing compares to the presence of God. Have, any, have anybody ever experienced that in their life? Amen. All right. So let's go on. Let me get set up real quick. Yeah. Come on, technology. And Brother Phil, where are you? Here we go. All right. We are ready to go. Let's bow our heads in prayer. God, we thank you once again for this time. We pray that you would bless your word. God, we are open and receptive to your word right now, God. Speak to our hearts. God, we just thank you for what you're going to do in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We are going to explore this passage in Exodus. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to it. If you have your apps, you can open it up. Hopefully yours works a little smoother than mine. We're reading from Exodus 17, uh, 1 through 7. And we're reading from the Message Bible. It goes as follows. Directed by God, the whole company of Israel moved on by stages from the wilderness of sin. They set camp at Rephidim, and there wasn't a drop of water for the people to drink. The people took Moses to task. Give us water to drink. But Moses said, why pester me? Why are you testing God? But the people were thirsty for water there. They complained to Moses, why did you take us out of Egypt and drag us out here with our children and our animals to die of thirst? Moses cried out to God, cried out in prayer to God, what can I do with these people any minute now? They will kill me. God said to Moses, go out ahead of the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel. Take the staff you used to strike the nail and go. I'm going to present before, I'm going to be present before you there on the rock at Horeb. You are to strike the rock. Water will gush out of it and the people will drink. Moses did what he said with the elders of Israel right there watching him. He named the place Masa, testing place, and Meribah, quarreling, because of the quarreling of the Israelites and because of their testing of God when they said, is God here with us or not? Is God here with us or not? So for our subject today, we're going to talk about straight out of water. <laughs> Yeah. All right, straight out of water. And I've been waiting to do this for a long time. So I was like, straight out of water. And the, the subtopic is what to do when the promise and reality don't line up. What, what do you do when your promise and your reality is not lining up? So let me just give you an a, a intro, a, su a summary of what has happened until verse 17. Until verse 17, the children of Israel were in slavery, right? They were in slavery for over 400 years. Um, they were crying out to God. They were in affliction. They hated it. They, you know, they did all. They were just crying. They were in misery. And then God uh, used Moses and told them, hey, I'm, gone. I'm about to get y'all up. I'm about to get y'all up out of here. Go let the people know we're going to, I'm going to set you free. All right? So pay attention. We're going to walk through. you got to pay attention to clues. There's clues all through here. The first clue, God gave them promises. Before he even set them free, he gave them a promise. This is what the promise was. He said, in verse chapter 6, he said, Say to the people, Moses, I am the Lord. I will bring you up out of the burden of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched hand, with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you from out under the burdens of the Egyptians. And you and I will bring you into a land that I swore to give you, to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for possession, for I am the Lord. That was the promise. That was the promise he gave so on, when they got through, you know, they got delivered, like, yeah, you know, they went to the Red Sea, remember the Red Sea, and we parsed the water, woo, we got out of there, 
And then they were hungry, like, man, we're hungry. Then God gave them, like, glorified frosted flakes that came from heaven. It was manna. And they were like, cool, we can eat. And then they're like, man, we're, we want meat, huh? Why can't we have meat? And then God would bring in quails, like, amazingly, from a quail to just blow in every day, right? But we got to, we get to verse chapter 17, and we have a real problem in chapter 17. You have over 2 million people traveling. There's 2 million people traveling. And so that's like if everyone in Berkeley, Oakland, Richmond, and San Jose, if we all decided to pack up, you know what, we don't want the Bay Area no more. We're going to pack up and we're going to Bakersfield, right? <laughs> that's like 200 miles. That's where the promised land, the promised land was only like 200 miles away. So it would be like if all of us was be like, we walk into Bakersfield, right? That's about 2 million people. So the trip should have only taken about 15 days with that big group. Should have just took about 15 days. It ended up being 40 years. Can you imagine us being lost trying to walk from here to Bakersfield for 40 years? That's a whole other story. But there was no water. There was no water. Just think about that. What if the drought got really real, like real real? And they was like, you know what, y'all playing, y'all ain't... Y'all not doing water conservation good, who's shutting off the water? My cousin here works for the water the officials. What are they like? We done. Shutting off the water. No more. How about, how would you feel? Like, what? No shower? No coffee? Like, no water? Like, it would get real, real, right, if there was no water. You know, the human beings can only survive, like, three to five days. Eh, roughly without water. Like, we really need water. So panic set in. It was enough for them to say, you know what, is God out here with us or not? I mean, what's really going on? I mean, Moses, you brought us out here. You said we're being delivered. And now, for real, we want out of water? Like, what, what's going on? Do I have any honest saints in the house that have said they've been there before? You're doing all you can do. All you know how come to church on Sundays. Trying to read your little Bible, do your devotions, and still there's shortage in your life. Shortage of joy, shortage of peace, financial shortages. What about all the promises that you're reading? What do you do when they don't match up to your reality? Have you been there before? Is God with God? Are you with me or not? Like, I made these moves for you. Like, what, what are we doing? It's, I call it the in-between time, right? Back in the day, the saints would say, I'm not broke. I'm in between blessings, right? I'm, I'm just in between. All right? But then where, what do you do when you're like, God, I, I stepped out. You told me to go for it. I went for it. You said take a chance. You said go out on a limb. And now there, there's no water? Like, what? You know, at this point, we could kind of start feeling a little sorry for children, like a little violin music on the, on the back. Yes, thank you, Mom, Loretta violin music in the back, like we could really start a campaign for the children of Israel at this point, like put a PSA on, please help the children of Israel, for they have no water, right? We could try to, we could, I think got a relevant point, can you try to like, man, no water, Moses, why would you bring them out there like that, right? But let me give you some background information before y'all start feeling too sorry for the little children of Israel, right? They had the same situation in Exodus 15, let's read it. Moses led the children of Israel from the Red Sea onto the wilderness of Shur. They traveled three days through the wilderness without finding any what? Water. They got to Mara, and they couldn't drink the water at Mara because it was bitter. That's why they called the place Mara, bitter. And the people complained to Moses, so what are we supposed to drink? So Moses cried out to God in prayer. God pointed him to a stick of wood. Moses threw it into the water. The water turned sweet. That's the place where God set up rules and procedures. That's where he started testing them. So, hmm. They, are, they already had one water close call before. What in the world is God doing in chapter 17? This is chapter 15. We already had a water close call. Could it be that he's bringing them around to the same situations to see what their response would be to the lack of shortage? He's testing their hearts to see if he really trusts them. 
Have you ever wondered why you keep dealing with the same stuff? Same financial crisis, same person getting on your nerves, same drama, same co-worker, same thing, same bill you can't pay. I just barely made rent last week, and now I can't even make it this, week, this month. It's always something, right? Could it be that God's bringing you back around over and over again to test your reaction, to see if you really trust him? See the pattern, pass the test. See the pattern, pass the test. You, you getting irritated. I don't know why everybody want to keep bothering me every month. Well, maybe you need to see the pattern and pass the test. Amen. God wanted to see if they would respond in faith or in grumbling and complaint. Right? They named this place Masa, the testing place, and Meribah, quarter, quarreling. So they're sitting right on the corner of testing and quarreling. Kind of like a lot of our lives. We're in the middle of a test. There's a lot of quarreling and strife going on in your lives, in your homes, in your jobs. And you don't know why. Like, why? Why is there so much going on? Why? I'm trying to go to church. I'm trying to believe in God. Why? Right? God was testing them. But instead, they tested God. Remember our scripture? They tested God. Testing. Testing. What is testing? Testing is when you know someone has the power to do it, but you don't believe them. Right? Anybody had an old school mama? That was like, don't test me. I wish you would. Don't try me today. Try it. Right? You know mama had the power to get you, but you still had to test. Still trying to... You know, testing. We kind of do the same thing to God. Testing. Just like Jesus had told Satan, don't put the Lord your God to the test. Why? Because we know he has all power, but God, I ain't going to believe it until I see it. You know, the whole the Thomas situation, right? I won't believe it until I see it for myself. Right? But why would God test you? That's kind of sounds like, come on, God, we're not... You know, we're not up here like, God, thank you for testing us. But that's not a part of our worship, right? Because how many people like tests? Raise your hand. I know we got cow people here. Y'all are geniuses. But how many of you like truly, like, do you really like tests? Come on now. Testing, they're like, oh my gosh. You get your syllabus, like, oh, there's tests, the finals. Come on, right? Give it up for finals. Woo, woo. See, nobody, nobody, nobody wants. And if you already graduated, you're like, I don't never want to go back, right? Right. Testing, testing is the only way you can practically, practically see the information you have taken in, right? Just think about it. There's no other way. You, you consume information. The only way that you show what's up here is that you have to have a test so you can see it apply. You can either write it, you can make it, you can do whatever, right? You have to be tested to see what's inside, to see what's in here, right? So these were the questions for the children of Israel. This was their test. Those are the only three questions that they had to answer. God wanted to know, do you know who I am? Do you know that I'm able to do? Do you know what I'm able to do? And how have I demonstrated to this? How have I demonstrated this to you before? That was their only, that was, the, that was three questions. Come on, if that was your final, three question final, what? That was their only final. Do you know who I am? Do you know what I am able to do? How have I demonstrated this to you before? See, he had to test their hearts because he wanted to know if they loved him or the promised land. Would they love him or where he was taking them? You know, God doesn't want us to love the answer prayer more than him. So the things that you're praying about now, he doesn't want you to love that more than him. He doesn't want you to love the gift more than the giver. You know, that's a lot of what, what, a lot of times, you know, a lot of the saints, if we got a million dollars right now, who Lord saints. We would be, I mean, people be in church on today. Church be like, what happened to the saints? They gone. <laughs> See, but God bless you with what, what you're praying for. Think about it. The thing you're praying for right now, if God really blessed you with that, when you really have your heart still, once you got that husband or wife, oh, you know, we're going on vacations on Sunday. Once you get your kids. So we have soccer now, so we won't be there. Right? 
You get that money, get that. You know, I need to wash my car on Sundays. That's the only day <laughs> that I'm free. So how many, you know, God wants to know if he really has your heart or will that thing have your heart. See, there's some character development God wants to work in us before he can answer that prayer. He wants to work out something. So he will test our hearts to see where our true intentions lie. He wants to know. You know, a lot of times, you know, people get frustrated and irritated at God during this time. God, where are you? During the test, you feel like you're going through a lot. I found this a good slide. This is really cute. It says, when you're going through something hard and wonder where God is, remember, the teacher is always quiet during the test. Amen? See, you thought God, you thought God was gone. You thought, everybody knows a good teacher. You're like, Miss Jenkins, Miss Jenkins, what? what about this? Shh. Miss Jenkins didn't even look at you. She's like... A lot of times you need to work out these practical things for yourself. So they said, is God with us or not? That's what they said. They felt like God abandoned them, that he was against them. And bottom line, they were mad at God. Now, I won't let, ask you to raise your hand. I'm sure you don't want to raise your hand on that one. But deep down in your heart, raise a little finger <laughs> behind your back. If you've been mad at God before, legitimately. Yeah. All right, brave saints, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, right, we're getting free in here. Come on, raise your hand if you've been mad at God. We've been mad at God before. We don't understand. Like, what? Why? Why? Where? What's going on? Right? Sometimes the promises and reality don't line up. Sometimes there are shortages. Sometimes God is testing to see if you really trust him. But through all this, don't miss God's heart. Yeah. Don't miss God's heart during tough times. See, we get mad at God when he's really testing us. Don't miss his heart. So I want to talk about a few points that will really change your life. I really feel like this is a prophetic word. Things you need to know about God's heart during these times. Because life happens, amen? amen? You could be good, bad, indifferent. Life happens to all of us. But when we're going through these tough times, how can we trust God's heart? All right? This is the first thing you need to know about God's heart. You need to know that God knows. But you need to sit with that for a minute. God knows. This was a revelation to me in my life. God knows. The verse here is Exodus 2. I'm kind of taking you guys, the, giving you the backstory. Before we got to chapter 17, this is all the things God told them along the way that they seem to have forgotten. Exodus 2. During those many days, the king, the, during those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob. And God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. God heard, God remembered, God saw, and God knew. This is a revelation. So like God even heard their what? Their groanings. That's how intimately God is involved in your life, and you thought he wasn't. He even heard their groanings. He didn't hear, hear the loud prayers and the, the just a, mm, Lord, mm. God heard their very groanings. See, this is a revelation to somebody because you thought God turned a blind eye to your situation. That violation, that abuse, that hurt, that wrong. So, what the Egyptians what the, were doing to the Israelites, that's like worst case social justice. Like, we're all about social justice. They are worse than what we fighting for. They didn't have no rights. So they got treated the worst. But God heard. God heard. He knew. Right? Just sit with that for a minute. This changed my life because I thought God didn't see what was going on, nor did he care. But... Contrary to the fact, he did. And look, when Moses went to tell the people, hey, look, God heard you. Look what their reaction was. 
in Exodus 4. And the people believed when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction and they bowed their heads and worshiped. So right now, just if you know that you got this revelation that God hears you, bow your head and worship right now. God, we thank you. They said they worship God. They just bowed their head and said, God, thank you. I didn't think you saw it. God, come on, someone just bow right now. Just worship God in your own way. God, I thank you. God, I thought you didn't see. I thought you wasn't there, but you're there. You, they were amazed. Like, God, I didn't know you saw. I didn't know you heard. Come on, bow your head and worship God. God, just God, thank you. Right? He saw it. He saw their afflictions. Right? Amen. So know that God knows. All right. The next thing you need to know about God heart, God, about God's heart is that this is a surprise to some people. Sometimes God makes things hard on purpose. Again, not one of our popular worship songs that we sing up here. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, you make it hard on purpose. Woo! We don't ever sing that song. Or that song, Brother Phil. <laughs> but it, nonetheless, it's true. It's true. Sometimes God makes it hard on purpose. Let's look at the verse. Uh, this is the um, English Standard Version. It says, but this is God talking to Moses. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my host, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. So sometimes God makes it hard. So you, some of you are sitting here like, wow, like, wait, like God's here to make my life like comfortable, right? Like I'm supposed to have my house and my car, my children, my husband, my wife, like God's here to make me comfortable. That's how we treat God. God, make me comfortable. I just want to be easy. Life to be easy. No problems, no up and downs. Everybody get along with me. Give me money in my bank account. That's all I want, Jesus. <laughs> right? But sometimes God makes it hard on, on purpose. Why? Okay, a lot of you guys, you know, go to gym. Woo! How many people try to work out? Yeah. So you pay good money to go to gym. You got little trainers. You got the Swole Patrol on, on board over here. You go to trainers. So what if you went and paid your money, got a trainer, and then he hands you a two-pound weight? You're like, here, here you go. We're going to work out. You know, you're like, no, no, I want to bulk up. Like, I don't want like, guns, and I want to be like, defined. He's like, here's your two-pound weight. They're like, what? Two-pound weight? What am I supposed to do with that? He's like, oh, I don't want to make you sweat too much. I don't want to make it uncomfortable for you. You know, I just want you to be nice and easy. I want it to be a comfortable time when you come to the gym. <laughs> You'll be like, dude, come on now. How many people, if you got a real hard workout, it hurts. It kills you. You're in agony. Okay. But it is doing what? Yes. Defining, yes. building yes. your muscles, right? Yes. Same with God. See, we want God to do all these little nice and easy things. That's not going to build you. Yes. That's not going to make you into the person that he wants you to be. So sometimes he makes it hard on purpose, just like that trainer puts that 30-pound weight on you, puts that 50-pound weight on you and says, now go, now press, now squat. You're like, what, are you crazy? I can't do three more. Like, right? So God could have easily gave them the easy route out of Egypt. Hey, Pharaoh, we about. <laughs> Pharaoh like, okay, yeah, you all did put y'all time in 400 years. Go ahead. Get on out of here, you crazy kids. Ah, right? Could have been easy. Then when they got to the promised land, hearts would have been far, far from God because it came way too easy. Just like parents. Parents were my parents in the house. When you're, when you're, when you're uh, yes, because you already know in my, the, the, the struggle. When, the, when your kids got the gimmies, give me $20. Give me this. Give me a ride. Give me this. Give me, give me, give me. Give me. Come on. Yes, I feel a breakthrough. 
when your kids have the gimmies, you can't always just slide them that twin, y'all. Sometimes they got to work for that, right? Mm. I didn't hear no shout from the youth. Mm. Charged. Sometimes you gotta get make them work for it. No, before I give you this twenty dollars, you gonna mow the lawn, you gonna wake up early, you gonna what, do this, you gonna do these chores, you gonna clean your room. Then you get your twenty dollars. Then what are you teaching them? They, they responsibility. And once you get that twenty dollars, guess what? They're not gonna spend it like, like the wind. They were like, ooh, I had to work for this twenty dollars. Let me five here, five there. I'm gonna put five under my pillow, right? You learn how to work for things, right? So God could have, God could have did it real easy for them. But what do you learn? God can make it real easy in your life right now. But what would you really learn? What would you really get out? How would you develop as a person? Who like? No one likes a spoiled kid that always is wanting stuff and getting stuff and tantrums when they don't get anything. God doesn't want us to be a bunch of spoiled kids that turn God into Santa Claus and get mad when he don't, God ain't answer my prayers and I ain't going to church. <laughs> right? <laughs> All right. Another thing about God's heart is that he wants you to have spiritual memorials. He wants you to have spiritual memorials in your life. All right? Our, our scripture comes from Exodus. Exodus 10 and 1. The Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians, and what sign I have done among them, that they may know that I am the Lord. See, the God wants you to have a spiritual legacy to pass on. He wants you to always be able to re remember a time when he did something mighty for you. You could tell your kids, woo, y'all, back in 2015, God came through for us. He goes, man, and then your kids are like, yeah, I didn't remember. And we did all come and pray about that, right? He wants you to have a legacy to pass on. So remember the test that he had? Do you, the, the children of Israel, they're supposed to know who God is, who am I, and what, how, what am I able to do? To order to pass that test, all they had to do but say, you know what? We're out of water again, but this is what we're going to do. God, we thank you that you are the God that rescued us from Egypt. You delivered us from the Red Sea. You brought manna for us to eat. You have quails to, to, that you gave us to eat. You've delivered us. And you know what? We were out of water before, and you made a way. So, God, now we're here, and we need water, and we're just looking to you because we know that you are more than able to do it. We know you are more than able. That's how they would have passed that test. That's how they would have passed the test. But instead they chose to grumble, murmur, and complain. They had spiritual amnesia. God ain't done nothing but brought us out and drug us out and did his wilderness for our kids to die. Things more like Moses really drug them out. They will. Oh, we getting up out. All right, we leaving. Now it's like Moses done drug us out here. Right? Spiritual amnesia. God doesn't want you to have spiritual amnesia. The chances are the same thing you're going through right now, you've been through before, and God made a way the last time. He provided for you last time. You came up with the money. A miracle happened. God gave you favor. Somebody let you in. Somebody opened the door. You got that apartment. You got that job. Your car got fixed. It always worked out, right? Now you're in the same crisis, and I was like, oh, Jesus, what we going to do, Lord? <laughs> we, don't, we get spiritual amnesia. God wants you to have a spiritual memorial. He wants you to have, I don't care if it's a journal, if it's a notebook. I don't know if you guys seen that movie War Room. The little lady had the thing on her, on her wall. She's like, what's this? Oh, this is my memorial. All the times that God came through, I write it down. So when you look back through that book, you look back on that wall, you're like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Two years ago, I had the same problem. Look at God came through right there. And then, wait, three years, oh, just last month, I couldn't pay the same bill, but God always made a way. Right? He wants you to have spiritual memorials. Think back on your life right now. Has God not come through every time? Come on, let's just have an honesty check. It might not be in the way you wanted it. <laughs>
It wasn't the way you planned it. You would have did a whole nother, but he's always come through for you. Thank you, Jesus. And then, you know what? God is so, God is so awesome. From, from, from then on, every, after he delivered them and did all this Egypt thing, look what he always referred to himself. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out, out of the land of Israel. And I, I, I'm sorry, out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. You could do your own word study. Go back and study all the times he refers to himself as, I, hey, 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 I'm the God that brought you out of Egypt. Hey, yeah, hey, 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 you. I, don't forget, I'm the God that brought you out of Egypt. I'm the one. He kept referring to himself after this instance as I'm the one who brought you out. God wants to do the same for you. He wants you to be, or whatever you're going through in your life, hey, guess what? I'm the God that paid your car note. I'm the God that worked a miracle for your family. I'm the one who healed your marriage. I'm the one that made a way for you to get into school. Have a hallmark in your life. God wants to, he wants to do it in you. Another thing about God's heart. Did you know that God wants to impress you? He does. He genuinely does. God wants to impress you. Now, these, are, these verses were so numerous. Like, you could do your own study in this, but look what he kept saying. He said, so you, you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. By this you will know that I am the Lord. That you may know that I am the Lord. He kept doing all these signs, these miracles, for one sole purpose, that you will know that I am the Lord. God is doing all these things in your life so that you will know that he is Lord. There's nobody else like him. No one beside him. No one else who can rescue you. No one else who can deliver you. All these things, think about your life. They're all set up for you to know that he is the Lord. Think about it. The Red Sea situation was cray cray. <laughs> They're coming out of Egypt. God leads them. He told Moses, take them this way. He takes them on a trail that leads to a dead end to the sea. There were mountains on either side. And guess who was coming up the rear? Pharaoh, who changed his mind. Like, wait a minute, we ain't letting all these people go. Let's go back and get them. Let's go. <laughs> they were like, no, nah, hold on, man. No. Nah. So God put them, led them, told them to go this way. I want y'all to go this way. Led them straight to the sea. Mountains on the side, Pharaoh in the rear. Oh my gosh, we gonna die. Right? That's what they thought. Now think about your life. Sometimes God puts you in impossible situations. And it's like, oh Lord, why, what am I supposed to do now? Every door is closed. Every option is closed. There's a no, 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 no. No way out. And then look. God comes out of nowhere, opens the sea. He does crazy things that you didn't even think of. They didn't even think the sea was going to open. Opens the sea, lets them walk on dry land. Now, I'm not talking about like it's muddy and they barely made it through. Dry, dry land. And made it all the way. Everybody, two million people made it over. And then when Pharaoh decided he wanted to go in there, what happens? Sea closed up. God wants to impress you. So instead of looking at your life like, man, my life is crazy. There's so many things going on. Mm -mm. Change your perspective. Your life is crazy. There's hard things going on because God wants to impress you. He wants you to be like, you know what? Watch me. Watch me make a way out of no way. You didn't think about this option. Watch this something open up for you. Watch. And we're so busy being mad at God. God, I'm mad at you. You didn't make it hard. No. He's like, no, 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 no. Look at my heart. I want to impress you. He wants to show you that he is God. How many people believe, believe that God is God? Come on, how many believe God on today? Woo! Yes, God. All right, God's heart, he wants to be your only option. This is God's heart. He wants to be your only option. These people crack me up. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said, hey, why are you quarreling with me? Why do you test the Lord? So instead of going straight to who? They went to Moses. Moses, give us something to drink. And I was like, hey, I'm not, whoa, I'm not God. But we do the same thing. We go to people instead of going to God. 
when you got you put a lot of pressure on the people in your life because you know you give me some love and affection and you make me whole and you complete me right now and they like whoa I'm not even capable of all that you need to go to God why are you quarreling with me why are you tested and talk to God? I'm not able to give you all you need. So stop looking for people. Stop looking to your bank account. Stop looking to like, you no, know, that bank account can come and go. Life happens. That your security can't be in that. God wants to be your only option. Your only option. He wants to be your go-to. So when it first happens, not Facebook, not Instagram, not your best friend in them. He wants you to go to him first. All right, and then our last point on this one is that miracles can flow from hard places. All right, Exodus 17, six. Um, Behold, I stand before you. I will stand before you there on the rock at Hor. And you shall strike the rock and the water shall come out of it. And the people would drink. So Moses did it in the sight of the elders of Israel. We didn't even talk about this miracle yet. Remember they were out of water, right? God leads them to a rock. A hard place. A hard thing. Leads them to a rock. Strikes the rock and water gushes out. This is amazing. Enough water for two million people. So yeah, you know, you get to Yosemite and the waterfalls and yay and all that stuff. But we're just talking about a rock. That comes from the water and the, the snow melts and all that. No, we're talking about a rock. God hit a rock and water, water gushed out. So look at that hard place in your life. You might be at a hard place in your life right now, but God wants to produce life from that hard place. He wants a miracle to flow from that hard place. You might be in a hard situation right now, but you got to remember that God can turn that around. He can give you life and refreshing. How many people need refreshing? You're going through a lot. You just feel like I'm between a rock and a hard place. Guess what? That water was refreshing. God wants to provide that for you, and he will. So in closing, what we can learn from this passage what can we learn from this passage? What can we learn from all this? What's the big takeaway? All right? The big takeaway is don't forfeit your rest in the test. Amen. Don't forfeit your rest in the test. You know, this, this particular uh, scripture that we're talking about in Exodus 17 became famous. It was famous. It was so famous that two books wrote about it in Psalms and in Hebrews. It was, it was super famous. And God, this is the message. Two different, you can look it up for yourself. Two different instances, God came back to this passage and said, God's saying today, please listen. Don't turn a deaf ear as in the bitter uprising. That's what it was categorized as. That time, in the wilderness, that time of wilderness testing. Even though they watched me work for 40 years, your ancestors refused to let me do it my way. Over and over they tried my patience, and I was provoked, oh, so provoked. I said they will never keep their minds on God. They refused to walk down my road. Exasperated, I vow they'll never get to where they're going, never be able to sit down and rest. Please don't let that be your testimony. Don't let that be your testimony, because when the testing time came, they refused keep God on their mind. They refuse to let him do it his way. A lot of us have been fighting God. Yeah. God, no. God, we ain't going to have it like this. No, it's going to be my way. You're going to answer the prayer the way I want it to be answered. Yeah. Don't fight God. Yeah. Don't forfeit your rest. Grumbling, murmuring, complaining, lack of belief kept them out of the promised land. And so this same group of people, guess what? They never got to the promised land. They wandered around like we walked from here to Bakersfield. They got lost from here to Bakersfield for 40 years and never made it into the wilderness until they all died off. And then their children got the promise. Yeah. Amen? Don't let that be your testimony. God has sent you here to hear this, this message so that you won't, you won't forfeit the rest God has for you. The rest God has for you came from Jesus when he died on the cross for our sins. We can now have free access 
to the rest that he has for you. So when you're going through stuff, you don't have to be a mess. You don't have to arrive to work all disheveled and, ooh, I'm just going through. You're mad at everybody. God wants you to go through with peace. He wants to give you. Anybody ever been through something really hard, but then you're like, I don't know why. I just feel peaceful. And everybody's like, girl, you okay? Man, how you holding up? you like, I'm good. Thank you, Lord. I mean, I feel it. It hurts. I'm going. But there's something going on. God wants to give you that rest. All right? And then our, our last point is um, mix God's promises with faith to pass the test. Mix God's promises with faith to pass your test. Think about the test you're going through right now in your life. Mix God's promises with faith to pass the test. And this is our last scripture. Hebrews 4 and 1. It's talking about the same passage. For as long then as that promise of resting in him pulls us on to God's goal for us, we need to be careful that we are not disqualified. We receive the same promises as those people in the wilderness. But the promises didn't do them a bit of good because they didn't receive the promises with faith. If we believing, though, if we believing, though, we'll experience that state of resting. We're hearing the same thing they heard. God wants to prove to you that he is the Lord of your life. That's all he wanted from you. He just wanted to trust him. He just wanted to be their God. You're hearing the same message. They disqualified their promise. But God said he wants to give you a state of rest. He wants you to mix his promises with us. So what, you're going to be in sometimes in life, you're going to have a promise and you're going to have reality and you don't mix. So mix your faith in there. What are your promises? You could always know that God loves you. He has a plan for you. He's working for you. He hears you. You're his child. He'll never leave you. He is faithful. So whatever you're going through, mix that with your promise. Mix your faith with your promise. God is hard right now, but I know you love me. God, I don't understand, but you'll never leave me. God, this is, um, oh man, I don't know if I'll have enough money to make, make it, but I know you're faithful. And then watch a rest and a peace that will come over your life. So just to review, We've seen that God has a flair for the dramatic, right? <laughs> he sets up hard, impossible situations in our lives, but it's all designed for you to realize that he is the Lord God Almighty. Amen? Amen. Trust God's heart. People, we got to trust God's heart. That's all he wanted from the children of Israel.